Well, good morning. I am glad to be back. Woo-wee. Uh, had last weekend off, which was exciting, but you know what? Being back up here now, you got those pregame jitters, and you're really, 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 really excited. Thank you very much, Cindy. I appreciate it. And so now with the pregame jitters, it's like, oh man, what's today going to bring? Last time we had the choir up here with the orchestra, uh, I got done and I asked my wife, how did it go? And she said, you know, you could have toned it down just a little bit. I brought a little bit of excitement. I said, or we could just do that every Sunday. How does that sound? And she's like, ah, I don't know about that. <laughs> Might be a little overwhelming. But it is, have, it is fun to have the choir and the orchestra and the excitement and the energy, which is what we hope every Sunday we come with, excitement and energy and passion. And one of the things that I've noticed as I get excited, I have a tendency to get up on my toes and start bouncing a little bit. And so hopefully today as you're in the seats, you're kind of up on your toes and you're bouncing and you're excited because we're here to study God's word and what he has for us and what he says to us that not just on Sunday, but every day of the week, the hope is that we are in God's word, that we are in the Bible, that we're reading it and understanding what he has to say to us. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about memory and the memories that we have and how to make memories. If I were to ask you about the favorite memory, your favorite memory in life, what would you tell me today? What is it? If you think about, maybe it's something from childhood. As I was thinking through memory, I was thinking about my childhood memories, and I'll have to be honest, I don't have many. <laughs> I don't remember much about my childhood. I have a very positive image of my childhood, but specific things I don't remember very well. Whereas my sister, she can recall every little thing that happened and tell us exactly what it is to where I'm pretty sure she's making it up because none of us remember it. She's like, remember at this moment when we were all wearing this and we did this at this place? We're like, no, that didn't happen. That's not real. She's like, yeah, it is. I remember it. She remembers it. So if you think about your favorite memory, how many times have you recalled that memory? How many times have you thought about that moment, whether it's from childhood or maybe it's the day that you got married or maybe it's the birth of your first child? Have you thought about it five times? Ten times, a hundred times, a thousand times. What is it that brings back that memory over and over and over again? And then if you think about that memory of yours and how many times you've recalled it, if I were to ask you today, would you tell me that you think that memory is pretty accurate? Would you say that memory, that fond memory that you have that you've remembered a lot of times, is it accurate or not? Well, science has actually told us that the more frequently we remember something, the less accurate it becomes. In fact, that favorite memory of yours may not have actually ever even happened, which is what my sister has a problem with. She's remembering <laughs> all these things. Well, recent studies have actually shown that the more we recall a memory, the less likely it is to be accurate. In fact, Northwestern Medicine in Chicago did a study on how we retain things and what that means in our life. And they found that as you bring back a memory again and again and again, your mind actually acts like telephone, the game telephone, where as it's repeated to somebody, it changes a little bit every time to the point at the end of the game, it's probably not the way that it started. In fact, the study said this, that every time you remember an event from the past, your brain networks change in ways that can alter the later recall of the event. Thus, the next time you remember it, you might not recall the original event, but what you remembered the previous time. A memory is not simply an image produced by time traveling back to the original event. It can be an image that is somewhat distorted because of the prior times you remembered it said Donna Bridge, a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and lead author of the paper on the study recently published in the Journal of, Neuro Journal of Neuroscience. Your memory of an event can grow less precise even to the point of being totally false with each retrieval. Fascinating. Which also explains why the fish keeps getting bigger, right? <laughs> or the touchdown pass was longer, or whatever it is, the story continues to grow. Not that we're lying. We just may be remembering something that never actually happened because it's continued to change as we've remembered it. See, the brain is a funny thing. 
It remembers what it wants to remember the way that it remembers it. And often at times, we have no way of controlling that. In fact, when you think about all of your memories, there's some I'm sure that you wish you could forget. And yet for some reason, they keep coming back over and over and over again. And yet there's things you wish you could remember, and yet for the life of you, you for some reason have forgotten it. You know what? God knew that about us. He created us exactly that way, and he understood who we are and how we need to remember things. And so he gave us tips and tricks on how to do that. See, we need to help ourselves remember, and we need to help ourselves remember frequently and accurately so we can share the story of what God has done. And so we're going to study a little bit about memory today in Joshua chapter 4. So I'm going to encourage you guys, open up with me, Joshua chapter 4. We're going to be in the whole chapter today. If you don't have a Bible, I'd love to give you one. There's a number of them on the back table back there in the worship center. Or you can download one on any smart device. Go to the app store, type in Bible. We use the Bible app. You can follow along with our slides online on the notes. You can take notes. You can save them. You can keep them for later. But we're going to be in Joshua chapter 4, and as we begin, I want to give a little bit of a recap of what got us to this point. So the Israelites have been in the desert. They were led by Moses out of Egypt, and they've been wandering. They've been wandering for 40 years, and that 40 years was significant because at the beginning of their time in the desert, they were given an opportunity to go into the promised land. And they were able to go into the promised land, and yet they decided not to and disobeyed God. And so because of that, they had to continue to wander And that the generation that had disobeyed God had to pass away before they could enter into the promised land for a second time. And so that generation passed away, and God raised up a new leader. His name was Joshua. And Joshua's responsibility was to lead this new generation into the promised land. Only two individuals from the previous generation were able to see the promised land, and that was Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua is now the leader of this group, and they're sitting there prepared to do what God has promised from the very beginning— When he chose Abraham, he said, I have a land for you, for the nation of Israel that I will make great. And out of that nation, there will be a blessing for all generations. And so we're studying that nation today because we live all the way on the other side of it to where we understand what that blessing was. That blessing was the fact that they would take the land and out of that land would come this man named Jesus. And because of Jesus, the whole world would have the opportunity for salvation. And we study that so we can get an understanding of who we are and why we're here and what we're doing and how God's plan has started at the beginning of time and continues to this day. And we are a continuation of this story. And it's important that we understand this story because in order to understand the story we're about to read, we then can look at our lives and see that the God that worked then is the same God that's alive today who has not changed from the beginning of time to this moment and how he worked then, he still works today. And so as we look at what he did with his people at that time, we can understand how he works with us at this time. And one of the things we're going to see today is that he wants us to remember and to remember accurately what it was that he did so we can tell future generations about the greatness of God. And so he brought them to this point where he has done a miracle. They wandered for 40 years. They came to the Jordan. The Jordan River was all that was standing between them and the promised land, and God parted it. And last week we saw him do that, and we heard from Rex on how he parted the Jordan, and they walked through on dry land, and he gave them enough space. He parted it up at Adam all the way down because two million people crossed this river. Two million people. I appreciated the numbers last week. That that is 30 stadiums, 30 U.S. bank stadiums full of people that walked across dry land. If you've ever been in U.S. Bank Stadium, when they release them all and you're caught in that rush, picture 30 of those crossing dry land in this wide expanse. So God said this was a huge moment, a big deal. I want you to remember this moment. And that's where we begin in Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. 
Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. And so I want to read through this together, but I want to pause as we go to kind of see some of the important parts and some things that we can take away from what it is that God's telling the Israelites to do that's important for us to remember today. And the first one is this. As the whole nation crossed, God's making a memory. God's starting a memory at this moment. He says, I want you to remember this moment. I want you to pay attention to what's about to happen here or what has happened here. And I'm going to give you a way to do that. So as you look back, you'll have a memorial. You'll have a monument to be able to remember this moment. Not that you're going to have to retrieve it from your brain. And as you continue to retrieve it, it could get distorted. And it may be fake once you finally get to this point. But I'm going to give you a way to remember this. And it's going to be a very key way. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to take 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan, right where the priests were with the ark. As you remember back to last week, the priests entered the water first with the ark ahead of everybody so they could see what was going on. And now they're standing in the middle of the Jordan with the ark of the covenant. The water is dry as far as the eye can see. Millions of people are about to cross over. He said, I want you to go ahead and from the very middle, take these stones because these stones are going to be important. Well, why were they going to be important? Well, they were going to represent everybody that had walked through this river. And they were going to be a way that the nation of Israel could remember exactly what happened on this day. So why only 12? Well, it says in here that they were the 12 tribes. But there's importance to this number, this 12, and importance within the 12 into the identity of who this group of people were. Because this 12 spoke very loudly. See, the 12 had two meanings behind it. First one was a national meaning. The 12 represented all the tribes from Israel, and so the whole nation within these 12 stones was represented. Every single person that was crossing or about to cross, all 2 million were represented in this 12 number. It was national because it was including every single person that was there because they were all a part of one of these tribes. But not only was there a national significance within this, there was an individual significance too. Because every single person was a part of the 12, they would identify with the fact that there were 12 stones because they knew not only was it national, but it was also individual because their identity lay within the idea of the 12. How do we relate to that today? Well, for many of us, it'd be like our last name, probably the easiest way to think about it. Your last name signifies the tribe that you come from. Or if you're married, it's the tribe that you married into that you're a part of. There's something important about your last name. We put significance behind that. Why didn't they pick up two million little stones and put them together individually? That would have been a pile everybody would have remembered, right? Well, it would have been a logistical nightmare to begin with. How do you get two million people to pick up a stone and put it in the same pile? Do they do it single file? Do they kind of throw it in? Do you pass it down a line? How would you do that? You really couldn't do that. But if you had individual stones that you were picking up and putting in a pile, would that have national significance? Maybe. But it would have been a pile of two million individual stones that you could say, well, this two million compiled the whole nation. But by taking this 12, you could do it in reverse way more effectively. Here's 12 that represents every single person here. That this 12 shows that you are a part of this. If we were to do that today, there's way more than 12 last names in this place. But if we were to take a stone for your last name, would you make the argument that you need multiple stones within your last name? Or could you just use one and understand that you're a part of that? You'd only need one. If you picked up a stone for the lilies, that stone, I would understand, represents not only my tribe, but it also represents me. I am a part of this. My parents and my grandparents worked hard to instill that in us. You're a lily. There's something about that. That means something. And you're going to pass on that name to somebody at some point. And right now, there's only one other male lily on this side of the family, and that's my son, Cruz. So Grant, Caitlin, come on, get it together. <laughs> but my brother, Curtis, has a daughter. Grant, Caitlin have two girls. I have two girls and one son. The only other individual in my family that has been able to figure out how to make a boy is my sister. Well, guess what? She doesn't have the name Lily anymore because she married into a different tribe. 
And yet there is something about the fact that they're going to carry on your name because they're a part of something important. And that's what these stones represented. There was something important going on here that all 12 tribes were a part of, but more so than that, every single individual was a part of what God was doing. They were a part of this. And so something we can take away from this is that we have to remember as we're a part of God's plan that we are in this together. There was this national implication and yet there was this individual implication. And the same thing holds true for us today. As we're a part of God's plan, we must remember that there's two aspects to it. Yes, there's the individual role that every single one of us has within that. There were two million individuals that walked across dry land. And yet together they were a nation. And so two million individuals were encompassed within these 12 stones, and they knew that there was something way bigger than just themselves that was going on, that God was moving forward and they were a part of it, individually and communally. Same thing holds true for us today. We must remember, we need to purposely understand what God is doing in our lives, not that just as an individual, but as a community, God is at work here, and we are in this together that we are moving forward together, but not just the group of individuals that sits here today. And that's what God is saying, that not only was this important for those that were watching what was taking place, this was important for those that were coming to. That this wasn't just a present issue, this was a future issue that I need you to remember this because everybody coming after you needs to know what happened right here. So let's continue on. As we see Joshua verse 6, it says, or 4 verse 6, In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. See, not only was it important for this generation, and why was it important for this generation? Just a reminder, this generation had not seen God do this before. They had not seen the Red Sea part. That generation was gone. They were left in the desert. This new generation walking through on dry land was the first time that they had seen God do something like this. It's not only that they need to remember it and understand that they were a part of something much bigger than what was going on just with them as individuals, but they also needed to create something that would remind the next generation of how great God was. See, one of the key things in the world we live in today is that we understand that it's not just our responsibility to remember who God is and what he has done, but it's our responsibility then to teach the next generation how great God is. And God knew that because he knew our memories were going to fade. He knew they'd become distorted. He knew that there was a chance that we would forget, even in the middle of a miracle, great things that he was doing, things that you and I wish we could see every day or at some point in our lives and say, God, just dry up that little pond right out there. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> Not that big of a deal, right? When my feet touch it, just go, <laughs> and we'll be good. And all 350, 400 of us in here will be like, yes, God is real. And God said, no, I understand you're going to forget. You're going to see signs. So I want you to set something up so this generation that saw it remembers. But even more so then, the next generation that comes will understand who God is. Because guess what? Every generation has to relearn who God is over and over and over again. And the responsibility of every generation before it then is to teach that generation the greatness of God so that they will understand. And one of the ways that we need to do that is we need to set up memorials to make sure that we are leaving the next generation with the understanding of how great God is. So what types of memorials do you have in your life? How are you helping this next generation understand who God is, because the second takeaway that we have here is that we must remind the next generation of the greatness of God. That we can't just rely on our own memories to look back and say, well, God did this in my life. We need to purposely set up things so that people can see what it is that God has done. What I love about being a part of New Life is that as we are here right this very minute, we are sitting inside a memorial. We are sitting inside a building that is a memorial to the greatness of God. The first time I walked through this building, I was informed that it was built in five stages, which was never really the plan. And it kind of happened by accident. And if you walk through, you can see it kind of moves that direction. And then the floor changes and there's another stage and the floor changes again and there's another stage. 
And then you walk out here and there's carpet, which is completely different than the rest of the building. So if you want to know how it got built in stages, just look at the floor. <laughs> and you can tell that there's different parts of the building. But what was absolutely incredible as I was given a tour of the building is the stories they then shared of what God had done in those stages and how he had been faithful all the way through. Stories of a gym that used to be a worship center that had carpeting and these horrific lights. And there was one right above the hoop that as you went to get a rebound and grab it, you're staring right into a light. You couldn't even see what was happening. And I have people that still walk through here going, hey, remember that nasty gym with the carpet? Man, wasn't that awesome? And yet that nasty gym with the carpet is no longer a nasty gym. Now it's an absolutely beautiful gym that no longer is used for worship because we've got this space. But as you continue through the building, you then go into what is the brand new gym, the beautiful gym that was built not too long ago. But if you walk on the second floor in the hallway of that gym, there's these bricks that remind you that at one point, that was the outside of the building. And yet in God's faithfulness, he said, you know what, I'm going to continue to go that direction with what I have for you, this plan that I have for you, and that you can see the remnants of what used to exist so you can be reminded of how great I am. As you walk into the front of this building then, just a couple years ago, it was built. It was brand new. And what used to be was a drive through where you drop your kids off. And yet God said, you know what, I'm going to continue to show you my faithfulness and I have this for you now. This building is a memorial to God's greatness, but you know what's really easy to do? To walk through this building and not understand those stories at all. And to walk by that brick on the second floor and not understand that that used to be the outside of the building. And not stand in awe as we're here going, God, you are so good. You are so great. And so as we walk the halls of this building, we have to intentionally tell the next generation of individuals, this is the greatness of God. And you are in it and you are watching it and you are observing it, which is exactly what needed to happen there. Because you know how easy it would have been for the next generation to walk by the Jordan River and have no idea what had happened? To walk by that exact spot years later and have no clue that that had taken place because that next generation would pass away and the next generation would pass away and the next generation would pass away. Because see, I'm not a part of the original generation in this building. And yet I stand in awe of the stories that are here hoping to be a part of that next generation going, God, what do you have for us next? Because I have been reminded of your greatness, and now I'm excited about your greatness, sitting here going, so what is it that you want for us, God? Where are we going now? Because of the great things that you have done, I have faith that you will continue those great things. And so this room that we're in right now, the stage that I'm standing on, I've heard has been here for 20 plus years, and it was never intended to be that way, so let's change it. Maybe the next phase of God's greatness is a new worship center. Woo! Woo! Or at least a new stage. Come on. <laughs> but whatever it is, whatever phase God takes us to, whatever he puts on the heart of the individuals here, the next phase is continuing to move forward because we understand of the greatness of God as we look back, remembering in a memorial of who he is and what he has done. And so we must over and over and over again, remind the next generation of the greatness of God. Because God knew memories would fade, and he said, set it up so they will remember for years to come, that they will continue to be a part of it, that they will be a generation that knows how great I am. And so we must be a generation that reminds people of what God has done. Moving on in verse 8, it says, So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. Now the priests who carried the Ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed, the ark of the Lord and the priests came to the other side while the people watched. The men of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over ready for battle and in front of the Israelites as Moses had directed. 
how 40,000 armed for battle crossed over before the Lord to the plains of Jericho for war. Just to pause real fast, that's a fulfillment of chapter 1. When Joshua said, unity, we need to be unified, he went to the two and a half tribes and he said, will you fulfill the promise that God has, or that you have made before God when Moses was leading? They said, yes, we will. And this is a fulfillment of that promise. As they crossed over, not only were they crossing over as part of what God was doing, but they were also at the very front like they had promised. Verse 14, that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they stood in awe of him all the days of his life, just as they had stood in awe of Moses, which is another fulfillment of God's promise, which is one of the sub-things, one of the sub-themes within Joshua is the fulfillment of God's promise, seeing it over and over and over again that God's plan will come to fruition and God's promises will be fulfilled. And you see hints of this all the way through Joshua, just with the tribes that they fulfilled or they were a fulfillment of God's promise. Here, Joshua God had promised that he would be elevated in chapter 3 to the level of Moses as a leader. And here it says, on that day he was exalted in the sight of Israel. And then verse 15, then the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant law to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. That's an incredible part of the passage. You see the fulfillment of these promises happening. You see God's provision as God, God's plan comes to fruition. They were told, go and do this, and it happened. And they were told, go and do this, and it happened. And they were told, go and do this. And so you see from chapter 3 that the Ark of the Covenant had gone before. The minute they put their foot in the water, it dried up. Two million people crossed on dry land. They walked together across the Jordan. And the Ark was the last thing to come out of the water. And the minute the Ark came out of the water, it went right back to where it was. So as we see God's plan to come, come to fruition, as we remember what it is that God is doing, as we are reminded of the greatness of God, the third thing that we can take away from this is that we must remember in all the things that have happened that it is the work of God and not man. We must remember this is the work of God and not man. God intentionally put the ark in front of the Israelites so they would see what it was that he was about to do. And as they stepped into the water, it went boom, done. As they stepped out of it, it came back. Why? Not because of anything that they had done, but because of what God had done. And this is a great reminder for us because as we are a part of God's plan, it's so easy for us to think at times that it actually has to do with me. How easy do you think it would have been for the priests to step into the water and go, whoa, that's really cool? <laughs> you see what just happened? Uh, it was my foot. Did you notice that? My foot went first. <laughs> I touched it. <laughs> Same thing happened on the way out. Step out of the water and all of a sudden it goes back. It's so easy for us to think because that my foot touched the water, I had something to do with it. And you got in there going, no, 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 I'm intentionally making sure that you understand that this was about me so that you will be reminded that you, yes, are a vehicle that I will use at times, that I need your feet to be the hands and feet of what I'm about to accomplish, which is super important. But as you're in the middle of it, be reminded that, yep, your foot touched the water, but it was my power, not yours. That I'm the one there with you, that I'm in this place, that I'm asking you to do this. And this is a fulfillment of my promise that when your feet go where I have said that they should go, I will do what I have promised you. For us today, there is power in that because we can understand that God will do the same thing with us and that even though it's not our feet, even though we remember it is a work of God, we can know that through us, his power can still be seen. Not my power, God's power. That as I step into the water, okay, God, here I go. Because the other side of it is, as the priests went forward with the Ark of the Covenant, what do you think they were thinking? Okay, what if this doesn't work? We're going to get really wet. This river's flowing pretty fast. It's at flood stage. God, okay. And as they're standing in the middle, as these guys are carrying stones, as there's two million people, how long would that have taken? I don't know. Rex said he did the numbers. A really long time. What if that water came back? God, what if I'm standing here in the middle of this river and all of a sudden it starts again? Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. 
And so there was a reliance on God and understanding that he was the one that was doing this and that in no way, shape, or form can we think that even though it was our feet, should we be able to take credit for it because it was God's power through his people. The same thing holds true today that as we step into the water wondering, God, are you going to do this? We can know that his power will be with us, but as we see incredible things happen, we must remember that it is a God thing, not a man thing. That is a work of God and not us. See, the Ark of the Covenant in this one passage is mentioned six times again and again and again to make sure that we put the right focus in the right place, that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, that God's power through his people was there. And that we can stand here, though, and know that great things will happen here as they have in the past, the same way it did there. But we must realize not because of my feet, but because of God's power. And yet, God, I need to step into the water so I can see you do great things. So that you will be exalted in the midst and that this can continue to be a memorial to what it is that you have done. And then my prayer needs to be, God, use me as I know you will but in your time, in your way, in your place. And that's exactly what happens here. This next verse, 19, could be easily overlooked, but says this. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. Why is this verse important? On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan. On the 10th day of the first month. See, this verse is important because of the fourth thing we can take away from this is that in God's plan, his timing is perfect. His timing is absolutely perfect. What's so perfect about the 10th day of the first month? If you go back to Exodus chapter 12, you'll see this. 12 verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron when they were back in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. See, 40 years before, on the 10th day of the first month, God provided a way for his people. And that way was remembered through this thing called Passover because on that day, God saved his people and started this journey to the Jordan. And on the 10th day of the first month, God showed that his plan was going to be perfect in his timing, exactly where he wanted it to be. And so what we see here is on the 10th day of the first month, their journey began. And on the 10th day of the first month, their journey ended. Exactly 40 years later. Which we then can go back to Joshua when he said, hey, in three days it's time to go. Why was he saying in three days it's time to go? Because in three days there's something really significant about to happen. But see, this generation that was going through the river probably had never celebrated Passover. In fact, we're going to talk about that next week. There was a recommitment to God that happens, which we will discuss this next week. So please be here next week. It's going to be an incredible weekend. I mean, all of them are, but next week even more, right? But here's a generation that may have had no idea the significance of the day they were about to walk out of the Jordan. And yet on that day, God said, I have a very specific day for you because I have a perfect plan. And you see in God's timing that on the exact same day this process began, the exact same day it ended. And so for us, we can know that as God works in our lives, whether we understand it or not, when he says go in three days, he's got a reason for it. He's got a purpose for it. He has a plan for it. And I can't wait till someday I get all the answers. Maybe not all the answers, but some of the answers say, God, why did that happen on this day? And why did this happen then? And why did that? And then when he transposes it all over the course of history, I'll sit there going, no way. I did that at that time. And that was then. And I mean, my daughter gets excited when famous people have birthdays on the same day as things that happen. And we live in God's plan that's way bigger than that. It's like understanding a celebrity was born on the same day you were. How cool is that? It's not. (laughs) It's not, it's not cool at all. Who cares? But to know that God started the journey on the same day that he ended it, how cool is that? Like, that blows me away because you see this huge plan that God's bringing to fruition, and he's right there in the details saying, this is so significant for me, you don't even understand what it is that I'm doing. 
See, God's doing the same thing in our life. And we've got to understand that even when we don't understand it, that his timing is perfect. Absolutely perfect. And this is going to be hard for us to understand at times because there are these things called trials and tribulations. And there are moments in life where we stand in situations going, God, I do not understand what you are doing at all right now. And things couldn't be any worse than they are. And yet I'm supposed to remember that you have a perfect plan for me. And the answer to that is yes. He does. There's a song that I'm a huge fan of right now by a group that I saw in concert a number of months ago. And it talks about the fact that God understands us even in our hard times. And one of the lines in the song is that what's true in the dark is true in the light. What's true in the light is true in the dark. See, when we're in the light, it's really easy to see the greatness of God. And we understand that on this day, for this purpose, in this moment, God brought this about. It's really easy for us to set up a memorial and say, God, you are so good. And yet we can understand that in the hard times where it's not so easy to set up that memorial, that God still is good and that his timing is still perfect. And whether we get it right now or not, he is bringing his plan to completion in his timing. So someday, when all is said and done, we can stand there going, no way. That is so cool. So God was with his people all the way through the good times, all the way through the bad times, to bring his plan to completion on the perfect day. There were no mistakes. His timing is perfect. Verse 20. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. See, what doesn't happen here is it doesn't differentiate between, hey, in the good times, you'll understand the Lord is powerful. No, in the bad times, you'll understand the Lord is powerful. No, in all times, we'll be able to look at this memorial and say, God, you are so good. And so my prayer is that here in this building, wherever you're at today, every time you walk into the place, you can remember, God, you are good, that this becomes a living memorial of God's greatness, that we can stand here in awe of what God is doing here, going, God, you are so good. You have been good. You are good. You will be good. And we must teach every generation in every situation that, God, you are good. And then we got to remember that just like he did to the Red Sea, he dried up the Jordan. And just like he's done through all of history, he will make a way. God will do it again. He will do it again. And he will do it again. And he will do it again. He may not do it the exact same way. In fact, as far as I know, God has not dried up anything else since then. He may dry something up at some point again. I pray every time I cross the St. Croix, be right now. (sighs) I'd love to see God dry something up and have us cross over on dry land. It may never happen again, and yet as we stand here today, we can know that God will do it again. Because you know what? The end of the story is written. And he's already told us that at the end of the book, he does it again. He shows up He saves his people. He returns victorious. In the meantime, until that day comes, I pray every single day, God, do something incredible. Do it again. Dry it up. And I want to place something as a memorial to your greatness so I can remember again and again and again. Because I do not want to forget. Because here's the challenge in this. Here's a warning to us. God had them set up a memorial. Why? Because even the miraculous can be forgotten. Even the miraculous can be forgotten. And so our warning today is the greatest threat to faith is forgetfulness. 
See, God said to the Israelites, you need to have this as a memorial so that you will remember, but so that generations after you will remember too, because even in the miracles, you will forget. You will forget my greatness. You will forget who I am. You must remember me. And so our warning today is, will we forget? We cannot. We must not forget who God is because as we stand here, that warning is true probably more than it's been in a really long time because what's happening in our nation right now? We are forgetting God. We have forgotten the great things that he has done. And I take responsibility for that. And I think we all should take responsibility for that. As we talk about kids leaving the church and all these things that are happening, all these phenomenons in our world today, is it because we've forgotten to remember how great God is? And if we've forgotten, is it because we have failed to teach people how great God is? And if we failed to teach them how great it is because we have failed to see it in our lives and tell people the greatness of what God has done? We cannot be that people. We must be a people who stand here today understanding the great things that he has done as a nation, as a people, as individuals. And then we must be individuals that as Joshua said, When they see us, we will be able to do this. That we will be able to tell the peoples of the earth that the hand of our Lord is powerful. And we will always fear him. So I pray that's our challenge this week. That we will not be a people that forget. That we will be a people that remember. And as we leave here today, that we will be a group that tells others the greatness of God. And that we will set up memorials for that. So tell your kids about it. Tell your grandkids about it. Tell everybody you know about it. And be reminded every time you walk in here that God is good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a great God and that you understand who we are and our finite ability to remember.